Section 36 of Gray's Anatomy, Part 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Steve Foreman. Anatomy of the Human Body, Part 1, by Henry Gray. The Scapula. The scapula forms the posterior part of the shoulder girdle. It is a flat, triangular bone with two surfaces, three borders, and three angles. Surfaces The costal or ventral surface presents a broad concavity, the suprascapular fossa. The medial two-thirds of the fossa are marked by several oblique ridges, which run lateralward and upward. The ridges give attachment to the tendinous insertions, and the surfaces between them to the fleshy fibers of the subscapularis. The lateral third of the fossa is smooth and covered by the fibers of this muscle. The fossa is separated from the vertebral border by smooth triangular areas at the medial and inferior angles, and in the interval between these by a narrow ridge which is often deficient. These triangular areas and the intervening ridge afford attachment to the serratus anterior. At the upper part of the fossa is a transverse depression, where the bone appears to be bent on itself along a line at right angles to and passing through the center of the glenoid cavity, forming the considerable angle called the subscapular angle. This gives greater strength to the body of the bone by its arched form, while the summit of the arch serves to support the spine in a chromion. The dorsal surface is arched from above downward and is subdivided into two unequal parts by the spine. The portion above the spine is called the supraspinatus fossa and that below it is the infraspinatus fossa. The supraspinatus fossa, the smaller of the two, is concave, smooth, and broader at its vertebral than at its humeral end. Its medial two-thirds is origin to the supraspinatus. The infraspinatus fossa is much larger than the preceding. Toward its vertebral margin, a shallow concavity is seen at its upper part. Its center presents a prominent convexity, while near the axillary border is a deep groove which runs from the upper towards the lower part. The medial two-thirds of the fossa give origin to the infraspinatus. The lateral third is covered by this muscle. The dorsal surface is marked near the axillary border by an elevated ridge, which runs from the lower part of the glenoid cavity downward and backward to the vertebral border about 2.5 centimeters above the inferior angle. The ridge serves for the attachment of a fibrous septum, which separates the infraspinatus from the teres major and teres minor. The surface between the ridge and the axillary border is narrow in the upper two-thirds of its extent, and is crossed near the center by a groove for the passage of the scapular circumflex vessels. It affords attachment to the teres minor. Its lower third presents a broader, somewhat triangular surface, which gives origin to the teres major, and over which the latissimus dorsi glides. Frequently the latter muscle takes origin by a few fibers from this part. The broad and narrow portions above alluded to are separated by an oblique line, which runs from the axillary border, downward and backward, to meet the elevated ridge. To it is attached a fibrous septum which separates the teres muscle from each other. The spine, spina scapulae. The spine is a prominent plate of bone which crosses obliquely the medial four-fifths of the dorsal surface of the scapula at its upper part and separates the supra from the infraspinatus fossa. It begins at the vertical border by a smooth triangular area over which the tendon of insertion of the lower part of the trapezius glides and, gradually becoming more elevated, ends in the acromion which overhangs the shoulder joint. The spine is triangular and flattened from above downward, its apex being directed towards the vertebral border. It presents two surfaces and three borders. Its superior surface is concave. 
It assists in forming the supraspinatus fossa and gives origin to part of the supraspinatus. Its inferior surface forms part of the infraspinatus fossa, gives origin to a portion of the infraspinatus, and presents near its center the orifice of a nutrient canal. Of the three borders, the anterior is attached to the dorsal surface of the bone. The posterior, or crest of the spine, is broad and presents two lips and an intervening rough interval. The trapezius is attached to the superior lip, and a rough tubercle is generally seen on the portion of the spine which receives the tendon of the insertion of the lower part of this muscle. The deltoideus is attached to the whole length of the inferior lip. The interval between the lips is subcutaneous and partly covered by the tendinous fibers of these muscles. The lateral border, or base, the shortest of the three, is slightly concave. Its edge is thick and round, is continuous above within the under surface of the acromion, below the neck of the scapula. It forms the medial boundary of the great scapular notch, which serves to connect the supra and infraspinatus fossa. The acromion. The acromion forms the summit of the shoulder and is a large, somewhat triangular, or oblong process, flattened from behind forward, projecting at first lateralward, and then curving upward and forward, so as to overhang the glenoid cavity. Its superior surface, directed upward, backward, and lateralward, is convex, rough, and gives attachment to some fibers of the deltoideus, and in the rest of its extent is subcutaneous. Its inferior surface is smooth and concave. Its lateral border is thick and irregular, and presents three or four tubercles for the tendinous origins of the deltoideus. Its medial border, shorter than the lateral, is concave, gives attachment to a portion of the trapezius, and presents about its center a small oval surface for articulation with the acromial end of the clavicle. Borders of the three borders of the scapula, the superior is the shortest and thinnest. It is concave and extends from the medial angle to the base of the coracoid process. At its lateral part is a deep semicircular notch, the scapular notch, formed partly by the base of the coracoid process. This notch is converted into a foramen by the superior transverse ligament and serves for the passage of the suprascapular nerve. Sometimes the ligament is ossified. The adjacent part of the superior border affords attachment to the omohyoideus. The axillary border is the thickest of the three. It begins above at the lower margin of the glenoid cavity and inclines obliquely downward and backward to the inferior angle. Immediately below the glenoid cavity is a rough impression the infraglenoid tuberosity, about 2.5 centimeters in length, which gives origin to the long head of the triceps brachii. In front of this is a longitudinal groove, which extends as far as the lower third of this border and affords origin to part of the subscapularis. The inferior third is thin and sharp and serves for the attachment of a few fibers of the teres major behind and of the subscapularis in front. The vertebral border is the longest of the three and extends from the medial to the inferior angle. It is arched, intermediate in thickness, between the superior and axillary borders, and the portion of it above the spine forms an obtuse angle with the part below. This border presents an anterior and a posterior lip and an intermediate narrow area. The anterior lip affords attachment to the serratus anterior the posterior lip to the supraspinatus above the spine, the infraspinatus below, the area between the two lips to the levator scapulae above the triangular surface at the commencement of the spine, to the rhomboideus minor on the edge of that surface, and to the rhomboideus major below it. This last is attached by means of the fibrous arch connected above to the lower part of the triangular surface at the base of the spine and below to the lower part of the border. Angles
Of the three angles, the medial, formed by the junction of the superior and vertebral borders, is thin, smooth, rounded, inclined somewhat lateralward, and gives attachment to a few fibers of the levator scapulae. The inferior angle, thick and rough, is formed by the union of the vertebral and axillary borders. Its dorsal surface affords attachment to the teres major, and frequently to a few fibers of the latissimus dorsi. The lateral angle is the thickest part of the bone, and is sometimes called the head of the scapula. On it is a shallow, piriform, articular surface, the glenoid cavity, which is directed lateralward and forward, and articulates with the head of the humerus. It is broader below than above, and its vertical diameter is the longest. The surface is covered with cartilage in a fresh state, and its margins, raised slightly, give attachment to a fibrocartilaginous structure, the glenoid labrum, which deepens the cavity. At its apex is a slight elevation, the supraglenoid tuberosity, to which the long head of the biceps brachii is attached. The neck of the scapula is the slightly constricted portion, which surrounds the head and is more distinct below and behind than above and in front. The coracoid process, processus coracoideus. The coracoid process is a thick curved process attached by a broad base to that upper part of the neck of the scapula. It runs at first upward and medialward, then becoming smaller, it changes its direction and projects forward and lateralward. The ascending portion, flattened from before backwards, presents in front a smooth concave surface across which the suprascapularis passes. The horizontal portion is flattened from above downward. Its upper surface is convex and irregular and gives attachment to the pectoralis minor. Under its surface is smooth. Its medial and lateral borders are rough. The former gives attachment to the pectoralis minor and the latter to the coracochromial ligament. The apex is embraced by the conjoined tendon of origin of the coracobrachialis and the short head of the biceps brachii and gives attachment to the coracoclavicular fascia. On the medial part of the root of the coracoid process is a rough impression for the attachment of the conoid ligament and running from it obliquely forward and lateralward onto the upper surface of the horizontal portion is an elevated ridge for the attachment of the trapezoid ligament. Structure. The head, processes, and the thickened part of the bone contains cancellous tissue. The rest consists of a thin layer of compact tissue. The central part of the supraspinatus fossa and the upper part of the infraspinatus fossa, but especially the former, are usually so thin as to be semi-transparent. Occasionally the bone is found wanting in this situation and the adjacent muscles are separated only by fibrous tissue. Ossification. The scapula is ossified from seven or more centers. One for the body, two for the coracoid process, two for the acromion, one for the vertebral border, and one for the inferior angle. Ossification of the body begins about the second month of fetal life by the formation of an irregular quadrilateral plate of bone immediately behind the glenoid cavity. This plate extends so as to form the chief part of the bone and spine growing up from its dorsal surface about the third month. At birth, a large part of the scapula is osseous, but the glenoid cavity, the coracoid process, the acromion, the vertebral border and the inferior angle are cartilaginous. From the 15th through the 18th month after birth, ossification takes place in the middle of the coracoid process, which as a rule becomes joined with the rest of the bone about the 15th year. Between the 14th and 20th years, ossification of the remaining parts take place in quick succession, and usually in the following order. First, in the root of the coracoid process in the form of a broad scale. Secondly, 
near the base of the acromion, thirdly in the inferior angle and contiguous part of the vertebral border, fourthly near the extremity of the acromion, fifthly in the vertebral border. The base of the acromion is formed by an extension from the spine. The two separate nuclei of the acromion unite and then join with the extension from the spine. The upper third of the glenoid cavity is ossified from a separate center, subcoracoid, which makes its appearance between the 10th and 11th years and joins between the 16th and the 18th. Further, an epiphyseal plate appears for the lower part of the glenoid cavity while the tip of the coracoid process frequently presents a separate nucleus. These various epiphyses are joined to the bone by the 25th year. Failure of the bony union between the acromion and spine sometimes occurs, the junction being affected by fibrous tissue or by an imperfect articulation. In some cases of supposed fracture of the acromion with ligamentous union, it is probable that the detached segment was never united to the rest of the bone. End of section 36.